everyone. We are here today. I am one of the mentors for the Association of Writers and Writing Programs. I've been honored to mentor several people through amazing projects. And whether that means in-depth manuscript review or chatting with them about life or any combination of those things. And uh, mentorship is very much a collaborative, I think, back and forth process. And I always learn so much from my mentees who are gifted writers and I'm able to go back to the page with renewed concentration and excitement. So I appreciate that so much about this program and that it's a very much a give and take program. I am here with three of my mentees, Brianna, Sadia, and Sarah. And we all have something in common, which is that we are all parents of young children. And this panel will uh, discuss writing or creativity and parenthood. And uh, we certainly don't have all the answers, but we're just going to chat about this, see where it goes, enjoy ourselves, and we hope that this panel will be of help to you. Um, so on that note, could you, I, could you introduce yourself, Brianna, please? Sure. Hi. Thank you, Kristen. And thanks to AWP for hosting this. And of course, the um, the Writer to Writer program. Um, I live in Tacoma Park, Maryland. I'm the mom to three kids. They're spread out in age. So I have an eight-year-old, a 13-year-old, and a 17-year-old. So that's like many different types of problems all at once. Um, I've always thought of myself as a writer, but for a long time, I would say I was a writer who didn't write very much. Uh, and then somewhere around 2016 or 2017, a uh, switch flipped for me, and I began to devote myself in a more serious way to writing the way I wanted to. And I spent a, a few years writing short stories, uh, and then a couple of years ago, I turned to writing a novel because that's what I was really dreaming of doing. Wonderful. It's an amazing novel, and we are looking forward to hearing about its journey as it continues. So. Thank you. Um, Sarah? Hi, thanks. Uh, I'll reiterate my, my thanks to Kristen and AWP. This is, this is really cool we get to do this. Um, and Brianna, I hear, just hearing you explain your trajectory, I feel um, that it's, mine is very similar. Um, I live in Atlanta. I'm a high school English teacher. And I have two kids who are 13 and 16. And similarly, I um, spent a lot of my life, I always knew I wanted to be a writer, um, but I was probably more focused on the academic route um, and ended up doing a PhD. I was the kind of person who just always wanted to be in school and I stayed in it as long as I could. Uh, and then it was also around 2016 when I started realizing, no, this isn't really the kind of writing I want to be doing and that I used to do and switched and focused more on fiction with short stories, uh, and then uh, moved on to novels as well, and have made my way through a few manuscripts. Um, and Kristen, you were kind enough to look at two of those, which was such an amazing experience. Yeah, thank you. I uh, The whole manu past manuscript to publication process is so full of twists and turns, and so I Hope they keep going out into the world. And finally, Sadia. Um, I, I, I live in New Jersey. I am a mother to two kids, uh, ages nine and six, and another one on the way any day now. Um, so I have to, I have to just give a little disclaimer. If I, if I lose my way or my thoughts in the middle of a sentence, it's largely because of the state of my my actual being is, is, is quite challenging right now. Um, but I will say that I started my writing journey um, as a, a sort of a public uh, online writing sort of experience last year, uh, right on my daughter's eighth birthday. I started writing publicly on Substack. Um, and uh, prior to that, I've, you know, I've written, I've written a lot of short stories and um, essays but I, I never considered myself a writer until I started publishing weekly, sometimes bi-weekly pieces around um, uh, nonfiction sort of topics. So I'm, I'm, I, I 
find myself, um, you know, having like a deadline of writing something, producing something every single week and, and uh, getting to produce things that my, that I want to read with my children as well. So, um, so that's sort of where I am. It, I'm very early in the journey as a, as a writer, I would say it's been a, it's been about a year, but prior to that, my career was mostly in public health writing and philanthropy. And so it's very academic. Um, and the types of things I get to write about now are much more centered on my own lived experience, which is something I had to give myself permission to do as a mother versus kind of hiding behind, you know, jargon and, and language that was, you know, sort of taught to me academically. So it's just such a joy to be with other women who are creatives right now. Thank you. And I, I love your sub stack. I'm yeah. always blown away by how, well, okay, how fast you can <laughs> turn these things out. Uh, and they're so profound and thought provoking. And if we have permission, we will share your sub stack in the notes so we can get you a few more readers. So if in any case, uh, you know, I'll share it with Brian and Sarah. So um, wonderful. Thank you all for coming. Uh, just a quick intro for me. I'm Kristen. I have two books of fiction published by small presses, The Transcriber, published as part of the Gemma Open Door series, and Outside Myself, which is published by Wyatt McKenzie Publishing. And um, I am, I have, I'm the mother to three children who are 13, 8, and 5. Uh, the numerology is a little bit scary this year with the way they add up. And um, it, they, they, keep me busy, uh, keep me away from my writing, and keep me thinking about writing. So, I don't know. Um, so before we get into our discussion, we would like to share some of our work with you. I'll keep the order the same for our reading portion, uh, and then I'll switch it up as we tackle each question that we've thought of together. So, um, Brianna, would you start us off, please? I sure would. Uh, this is a very short story called Percolator, uh, and it was published in Emerge Literary Journal. Percolator. My grandmother is standing by my coffee pot, making a show of wiping crumbs from the counter onto her open palm. It is 6.30 in the morning. Grandma's wearing the same toothpaste green house dress she wore when I was a kid, its fabric soft and thin from so many turns in the washing machine. Her hair is pinned into curls. She never paid for a permanent, not even later when she could afford it. The depression never let go of some people, is what my mother used to say. Grandma looks exactly like she always did, except that her ankles, peeking out above her slippers, are no longer webbed with purple spider veins. That's when I remember she's dead. What are you doing here? I remove yesterday's coffee grinds and dump them into the trash can. You really shouldn't let that sit overnight, Grandma says. You'll get mold in your machine. Grandma used to boil her coffee in a dented aluminum percolator. She scrubbed it every day with steel wool. Do you want a cup of coffee? I open the drawer and pull out the coffee scoop. Grandma sniffs. Is she offended or disgusted? Sorry, I guess you can't drink coffee. My mother used to whisper to herself while she drank her first cup as if breathing secrets into the dark brew. I assumed she was talking to herself, but now I wonder. As I fill the carafe with water, Grandma lifts her eyebrows, her eyes locked on my left hand. When'd you stop wearing your wedding ring? My own husband hasn't noticed this yet. Are your fingers getting fat or are you unhappy? I consider taking the easy way out, but Grandma gives me that old knowing look, the one that says, don't try any of your funny business on me, young lady. At first it was because it was getting tight, but then I realized it never felt right to begin with. My grandmother frowns and nods her head as if to say that this is serious, but she's on my side. I don't know if I ever wanted to be married. I think I got married because that's what everyone does. I think I pause because as an educated woman, I'm not sure I can say this next bit out loud. Grandma urges me on by widening her eyes and leaning closer. I think I wanted to have a party and wear a white dress. I push these words out in a single breath. Shame licks my cheeks and reddens them. You did look beautiful in that dress. 
You were there? Of course I was there, sweetheart. She reaches her hand out into the space between us. I know she would caress my cheek if only she weren't a ghost. Have you talked to your mother about all this? Whatever happened to my grandmother's percolator, her house dress? I don't think she'll understand, I say. How do objects leave our lives? What will happen to my wedding ring if I choose never to wear it again? Maybe she'll surprise you, Grandma says. And people, why do we sometimes let go of the living but hold on to the dead? Maybe she'll judge me, I say. I do not say that I haven't called my mother in two months, but, grandma, but maybe Grandma already knows. Maybe that's why she's here. I'll talk to her first. Get her used to the idea, Grandma says. She glances at the clock on the stove. She should be waking up about now. I'll pop over for coffee. Beautiful. Thank you. I think I'd rather just end the panel and think about this. But OK, uh, Sarah, go ahead. Uh, OK, so um, I'm going to read a short story that um, it's coming out from uh, Pembroke Magazine um, in June. And um, I just wanted to say, uh, Kristen, I, I, you might recognize part of this. I can't remember if this was in, um, so, so basically this is, I, I wrote a novel about uh, a, a woman who's raised by anarchists at sea and then goes off and has a lot of different adventures and experiences. And it was definitely uh, the kind of novel that um, suffered from some loose baggy monster <laughs> syndrome, you know, there was just so much in it. And I ended up doing a lot of cutting. And so this, I ended up cutting this part of the story. Um, but it's kind of nice that it, you know, fiction can do this, where it can have a rebirth and a, as a short story. Um, so I just want to emphasize though that this is fiction uh, because the title is Confessions of a Weed Dealer Who Just Did What She Did for Her Own Good. Nice. I remember that novel. <laughs> okay, good, good. All right, so here we go. During my second year of college, my always thinking about himself father abandoned his family in favor of hell, leaving us with nothing. No, less than nothing. Suicide wasn't covered by his life insurance policy, and there was all that secret debt he'd saddled us with. So the way I saw it, I had two options. Go back to nowhere land, Missouri, a place drenched in my mother's bogus tears, or else take up a new vocation. Independent pharmaceutical contracting, to be specific. Columbia was the perfect place to deal. Privileged and pocketed, its students eager for deviance with money to spare and no idea what the going rate was. When I showed up at their door, the male clients would usually invite their buddies over, automatic referrals, and the female clients felt safer with me. For my own safety, I carried a Glock 26 and a sport belt holster against the small of my back. Hiding it there, though, also meant having to hide my skin away, even in the boggy days of a New York summer. The holster rubbed my skin raw, and the constant pressure gave me bruises that blued, purpled, yellowed, then blued, purpled, and yellowed all over again before it finally adapted. Amazing what the human body can learn to live with. My grower was a reefer whisperer and obsessed with my ass, commenting on it every time I left his Bloomingdale district apartment. I love to see you go, Deb. I love to see you go. I hadn't known what to expect from a grower's setup, but Raphael's place hadn't been it. In the corner of the front room sat a mustard yellow sofa straight out of the 1950s, plastic protection and everything. On the walls were framed doilies of all different shapes and sizes, encapsulated snowflakes. If doily collection was other people's pastimes, I couldn't imagine anyone's portfolio rivaling Raphael's. It was less than a year before things got dicey. Marcus Beam was a regular client who dropped out of Columbia to program a computer application that would have allowed radio stations to broadcast through the internet, but someone beat him to it. When he tried and failed to repurpose the code, his parents cut him off, and for the next half decade, his brooding allure had allowed him to sneak into parties, bang the college chicks, and steal their cash. But now his forehead was climbing higher, his lingo was dated, the burgeoning tech industry had left him far behind, and he'd been relegated to that old unwelcome crasher. I'd actually liked him at first. He seemed a fellow solitary animal, a scavenger. 
Plus, he wore me away from pretentious professors and told good stories about now famous alums he'd once gotten high with. At each of my deliveries, he'd invite me in. It's 420 somewhere. After a while, that started to grate. Why so curious, I asked, when he wouldn't stop pestering me about my MO. Funny you should ask. Smoke spewed with his chortle and the couch shook. Then he announced, as if he were doing me a favor, that he planned to start dealing himself. And when he passed me the joint, he grabbed my hand. I wondered for a brief moment if he was going to get down on one knee. I want you to set me up, Deb. My eyes wandered over the expanse of his two-bedroom apartment, still decorated with bean bags, posters curling away from the walls, crates covered with blankets serving as tables, even a lava lamp. The place was littered like a highway exit. Sorry, Marcus. My grower makes just enough for me to sell. His smile was gone, the usual darkness sliding back into place. I ashed the joint and pretended not to notice his glare. Then I ran out of things to look at besides him. I guess I could ask if he knows anyone looking for a dealer. Do, he said, exhaling cloudy plumes. When I told him I had to get going, he said, hit and run, huh? And laughed through the coughs. The sound was like someone shoving a metal scoop into a barrel of ice. And when his front door closed behind me, it cut off the icy laughter, leaving me in silence and with no intention of talking to Raphael. And that's where I'll stop for now. Cool. Well, we will look forward to reading and or hearing the rest when it is published. Thank you. Uh, and Sadia? I will be reading uh, one of my more popular posts for my Substack, stack, um, which is called Ugly Shoes and Paper Planes. I didn't get a chance to explain that title. Um, it's basically writing through the ugly stage of motherhood um, when everything is really about your children because they're so young and needy and your spouse and your house and your career uh, that it's hard to kind of create space for your own creativity. Um, so this, this piece that I wrote was popular. Um, it was called, it's called Ramadan is the, is a month of love. Um, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna read this. Most people think of Ramadan as a month of sacrifice, caffeine withdrawal, lack of sleep, or huge feasting parties. What Ramadan is actually about is developing as a person, creating healthy habits, and learning self-discipline. Many of these topics I gently touch on in my Ramadan learning series. So I'd written a, a series essentially um, of micro lessons that I was learning during this month. Uh, but one thing is missing. Ramadan is a month of love. The more I love someone, the more time I want with them. They are on my mind constantly when I wake up or before I go to bed. Remembering them is automatic and their preferences become my preferences. How do I stay in this state of love? especially if the one I love is no longer in this world. Doesn't that feel a little one-sided? Is it more devotion than love? What do I get from loving someone who does not respond? Ramadan is a time to connect deeply with the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, because he's the model and mode by which Muslims understand divine de decree. He's the one who showed us how to behave, how to be in the world, and how to become the best, best versions of ourselves. He was deeply caring and considerate of people, even people who hated him. I'm part of a community in which this love operates as a core tenant. I'm with other people who also love him. So there's a system and a structure in place to facilitate learning, growth, and remembering the beloved. There's a place to ask hard questions and to sit with the despair of holding onto a faith during mass ethnic cleansing of Muslims on a global scale. When there's so much systematic ha hatred directed at you, what else can you do but lean into love? Many details of his life feel so hard even in the modern age. Muslims never started with a false premise of their prophet's perfection. We were told repeatedly he was a man, he was tested despite being the messenger. For example, he buried all of his sons, his grandsons, only his daughters survived to adulthood. He grew up with no access to prestige or power as an orphan from the age of six. He became a leader of a civilization, but his followers, his first followers were his wife, then a child, and then a slave. This is not an insignificant sequence. He won battles, he lost battles. He lived in poverty, rejecting the riches promised to him if he would stop talking about monotheism. His life was full of tribulation despite his status and proximity. Muslims take many lessons from his life, but a primary lesson is that God tests those he loves. Muslims didn't inherit a set of archaic or rigid rules like women cannot touch the holy books 
or a false notion of celibacy, or a theology that connects wealth to godliness. Muslims are not a monolith by any means, but this thread of love is woven through every culture of this global community. Muslims inherited songs and stories that illustrated the details of his life, what he said, what he did. The most intimate details of his life are captured in stories and explicit narrations, especially from his wife. So many stories of who he was came from his friends and family. Aren't those the people who know you best? I've read the Old Testament and the New Testament, mandatory reading in a liberal arts college, but I never had to read the stories of the prophet's life. I spent a year studying the Odyssey and the Iliad, but I never studied the Qasida Burda by al Siri. I never heard of this love poem until relatively recently. From attending just one class, I wanted to share just a fragment of what I learned. Despite my ignorance, this love poem has been memorized and recited for centuries. al Siri's Burda is the most famous poem known as the Burda, but the poem originally known by that name was composed by poet Kab ibn Zuhair, one of his companions. Before accepting Islam, Kab used his poetry to slander Muslims. He was a poet who mocked the Muslims. When he became Muslim, he wrote and recited this poem to the prophet and other companions to express his remorse over his past actions. When he finished reading it, the prophet threw his cloak, his burda, to Kab. That's why the poem is known as the burda, because this is a sort of apology. And the prophet responds by taking off his own cloak and gifting it to the man who used to hate him. So last weekend, I attended my first class on the Burda, taught by a, a scholar, a, a professor, Dr. Ibrahim, a historian of the modern Middle East, and Sheikh Yasser Fami. The class drew over 100 people, men and women, on a Sunday afternoon. In fact, it was a gorgeous Sunday, A sunlight streamed through the large bay windows of the masjid on Church Street. The irony is not lost on me. I was tempted to leave, to run errands before Costco closed. What brings families... Uh, what brings families to spend a few hours reflecting and learning like this? Love. So inside the masjid, a chorus of voices sang. I'll, I'll spare you my Arabic because it's, it's not great. Um, but essentially the, the translation of which is, Oh, my Lord, bless and grant peace always and forever upon your beloved one, the best of all creation. People sat and sang as we contemplated the words in the text. Being in love, I try to my best to remember and follow little habits I learned from his life. I try to read his bi biography. I try to learn more about him. I tell my kids about what a love like this does to character and behavior. I try to memorize something he said and retell stories of how he acted, how he responded to his enemies. I weave in anecdotes from what little I know to share with my children. When you're in love, everything reminds you of the beloved. In my house, I'm rereading uh, Sheen, Sean, Sean Covey's The Seven Habits of Happy Kids with my children. Each of these short stories relates to a story of the prophet in my mind. Each of Covey's principles of virtues from responsibility, respect, teamwork, and balance connect to a different part of the prophet's biography. So I make these not so obvious connections. For example, in Big Bad Badgers, the Seven Oaks friends learn how to work together as a team to defeat the Badgers in a game of soccer. When they work alone, they cannot even score one goal against the Badgers. They lead the skunks, stop to pick flowers, and Pokey decides to take a nap in the middle of the game. But when they focused on each person's unique strengths and began playing as a team, they were unstoppable against a formidable opponent. This is an analogy for how each companion or friend of the prophet had unique assets or liabilities, and yet they had to learn to work together for the sake of a larger vision. An example of his gentleness. Recently, I was struck by a hadith in which someone, a man, came to the prophet and asked him if he could commit adultery. And rather than rebuke him, the prophet gently asked him, would you want this for your mom, your sister, your daughter, your maternal aunt? Each time the companion said no, and the prophet said, then stay away from it. While God is explicit about the punishment uh, for adultery, the prophet is gentle in his approach to human desire to want more than what you have. There are countless stories like this, and I'm, I'm always struck by his gentleness and compassion for the range of human emotions. Rather than judgment, which is what people expect from the prophet of God, he was, he was pretty open, accessible, and kind. He showed us how to behave in the most turbulent of times. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. I love how you pull all of those resources into your reflection. And I appreciate you sharing it with us.
yet, I will read the first chapter of uh, a book called The Transcriber. Um, it's the book, uh, really a short story told from the point of view of a boy whose sister is blind. This first chapter is called Signs. On the strip of grass between the sidewalk and the street, on the left side of my house, a sign stands as if it were part of our land. It says, Blind Child Area. There used to be two of these signs, one guarding each side of our house, like soldiers. Now there's just one. I ask mom why we have to have signs telling the world that Emily is blind, or why we have to tell everybody we have a blind person living in our house. She said the town insisted on putting them up so that people who are driving too quickly will see the signs, slow down, and look to see if Emily is in any danger of being run over. But Emily's not stupid. If she wants to play in the street and get run over, that's her decision. She knows she's not supposed to play there. And if she gets killed by a car, that's her own fault, not the driver's. The sign also makes it seem like Emily is only allowed to play in the blind child area, not in anyone else's space. What if a car hits her in someone else's area? Does that mean it's her fault because she didn't play near the sign? Emily can't even see the darn thing. She knows where the signpost is, but she can't read the words. And what about me? I live here too. The sign should say blind child and sighted child area or something. And if I'm playing in the street near the sign, is it okay for the driver to run me over? You'd think from the way it stands that the sign will always be there, but that's not true. Like I said, there used to be two of them, one to the left and one to the right, both proclaiming the same message. Someone stole one about a month ago. I didn't know why anyone would want to steal a sign saying blind child area. Who else in the world besides us needs a sign like that? If I had my pick, I'd steal. Stop! But maybe there are people out there who collect signs, whose mission is li in life is to have one of every kind of street sign in the world. I can imagine my dad as a kid collecting signs, or at least stealing one, but he'd never tell me if he did. Maybe someone in the world really needs Blind Child Area to go with Village of Minisink Hills, which hangs on the wall in our hallway, and yield and keep right. Maybe that kind of collector steals signs from every country. I should find out what traffic signs say in Australia. Perhaps there are sign stealing competitions. Blind Child Area would score high in originality. There just aren't that many. So they must be collector's items, but it would score pretty low in risk taking. Whoever pinched it wouldn't have to climb out onto the median like they would if they were stealing a highway exit sign. Or maybe there are people who don't want the drivers to know Emily is blind, who want someone to run Emily down. Okay, so that concludes the reading part of this panel. I was just going to say, Kristen, I loved the, the voice in that piece. Thank you. It is fun because it was so different from me, like not taking risks. So I liked it. Thank you. Okay. Um, we're ready to get started with this panel. So my first question for all of you is, what are your literary, cultural, or writing influences? And I will start with Sarah. Okay. This is a hard question, I think, for me to answer because um, I feel like I could go on forever. Um, I, I guess I said at the beginning that I've been a reader and, and know, knowing I want to be a writer since as long as I can remember. And I guess that's probably the case for a lot of us. Um, just I was, you know, I was the weird kind of kid who always preferred books to people. <laughs> and um, so I just read as much as I could. Uh, and always felt like I wanted to be reading more. So I, I just, I read very widely when I was young. I was, you know, interested in the classics even from a very young age, but also like Babysitter Club series. I read the whole thing and every Agatha Christie book I could get my hands on. So I just, yeah, I just wanted to take it all in. And then, as I said before, also, I um, wanted to to just immerse myself in reading and literature and thinking about 
writing. So I stayed in school uh, and got that PhD. And that kind of took me down that more, as I said, academic route and just immersed myself in a lot of writers. Um, I ended up uh, writing my dissertation on 20th century writers of color. And um, obviously, we're just hugely inspired by so many of those writers. Um, people like Maxine Hong Kingston and Leslie Marvin Silko are a couple of my all time favorites. Um, and then has a, now as a high school teacher, um, this is my classroom, um, I'm obviously reading a wide range of stuff uh, always as well. And what am I still, I, this is kind of cliche as an English teacher, but to say, but um, one of my, you know, this, the, the book that I just keep, am just in awe of every time I teach it is The Great Gatsby. Um, and I just think, I think what I most admire, maybe who I'm most influenced by and inspired by are the kinds of writers, all of whom I think I just listed, who find, they find the balance between um, just great storytelling where you want to find out what happens next, the plot just drives you, and at the same time you're given the gift of what what writing can do, what words can do, and just appreciating the beauty um, and the artfulness of expression um, and learn and learning along the way, just being reading about what it means to be a human being, you know, those so what those writers can do are, are what I what I aspire to do, I think. Yeah. Sadia. Sarah, that was so beautiful. Like I I was nodding along um, to everything you said because I I also growing up preferred books to people. And um, most of my sort of influences uh, were for my English teachers, like who like I remember Mr. Gurn in, in high school, you know, spent an entire year on the Iliad and the Odyssey. Like we didn't read anything else except these two classics. And, um, you know, it just like when you love something, like when you love literature or you love the written word in this way, you can spend an inordinate amount of time, you know, sort of delving into every piece of it. And I, I just, I, I loved that. I, I ended up not studying that. Um, I studied philosophy and, uh, and then uh, sort of management and stuff, but I, I definitely found that um, my sort of preferences uh, have been uh, like I've discovered South Asian writers and Muslim American writers like much later in my life, like in, in high school and in, you know, in school, like there was, there was very little voices from people of color necessarily. Um, but now it's very different. The market is very different. Um, but, uh, but I think as an American of sort of Bengali and Indian origin, you know, as an immigrant, as a New Yorker at heart, um, I've sort of, I've sort of tried to find uh, you know, a very eclectic mix of, of writers that I, I turn to uh, for inspiration. And um, one of my favorites, one of my favorite YA writers right now is Saba Tahir. I read all of her fantasy books during the pandemic when I was losing my mind with, with two little toddlers. Um, and, uh, and then she's written, she's written a um, All My Rage, uh, which was, uh, which was fiction. Uh, and it was just it, it, like the story stays with me. Like it, I mean, and that's what great literature does. It, it's sort of, you can't, you can't just close the book and forget the story. You just, you just see it in so many other places in your life. And so um, I, I hope to, you know, go back to, to fiction. I've been writing a lot of nonfiction these days, but but my true love is 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 going back into into the fiction world. Thank you, Brianna. Well, surprising to no one in this little club. Uh, I, I was a similar kind of child who got in trouble for reading sort of too much, um, and you know, as you all are talking, like it brought back a memory of actually the first time I ever noticed writing as writing. And I think I was in about the fourth grade and I read this book called Autumn Street, which is by Lois Lowry, who is now quite famous for The Giver. And that all came later. She's written many, many books. Um, but the first page of that was so beautiful. And my mom was sitting next to me reading. And I was like, mom, mom, listen to this. And I read the words to her. 
And um, I just really noticed for the first time, a, a writer isn't just telling a story, they're choosing the words to make art. And so that really made a very deep impression on me. Um, but otherwise, my answer to this question is a little bit different in that I think the thing like right now that leaves the most fingerprints on my work is actually music because I listen to music all the time when I'm writing. Um, and in the book I'm writing right now, uh, there is a character who is a, a pianist. She dreamt of being a piano teacher, a, a concert pianist, and she's a piano teacher who really actually doesn't have any students anymore. Uh, but she still plays every day. And so I listen a, to a lot of music when I write about her um, and Chopin has just like, I've really connected very deeply with Chopin while writing this book. Um, and there are also a lot of contemporary composers that I've sort of found through this process that really inspire me, that help me get into certain moods or help me access feelings um, that bring me closer to the story. Uh, and then in terms of writers, uh, I read very broadly. I would say the writers that um, I connect with in terms of um, where I feel like they're doing something that's connected to what I hope to do. I would say Elizabeth Strout is a really big inspiration to me. Her character, Olive Kitteridge, who is like so lovable and so detestable at the same time, I find really powerful. Uh, as well as Anne Enright, who is an Irish author and the Canadian author, Miriam Taves, who uh, writes very sad stories that are so infused with humor. Uh, and I mean, write a scene that can make somebody laugh and cry all on the same page. And I think then you can call yourself a writer. So that's something I aspire to. That's amazing. I love the tidbits of craft that you are all letting through along the way in that question. Um, by the way, just the the balance of plot and character and stories that stay with you and the the choices of words to make art and uh, all those things. So thank you for the bonus. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about parenthood and writing since I had a small child and, and there was a time when I wrote a lot more about it and now I'm sort of feeling a little more conflicted about writing about my own family. But um, I've read also other parent writers sort of trying to navigate or push against the idea that their kids are either an inspiration or a challenge when it comes to writing. So how do you each feel about this, um, this idea that, you know, the either the inspiration or the challenge or like what parenthood does for your writing, either along with that or beyond that? Um, and I'll start with Sadia this time. As someone who is ready to pop any day now, I mean, I could like get up and like show you ladies where I am right now in my 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 uh, <laughs> my pregnancy. Um, I worry about this all the time because it took me a very long time to even start writing. Um, uh, and i I had postpartum with my first. And the writing was a sort of, um, it was like salvation for my mind. Like it was like the only thing that was holding me together um, as I was working and, you know, adjusting to life with baby and all of that. Like the writing was like the thing that um, I felt grounded me into who I was. Uh, and so, you know, having multiple children and then multiple responsibilities and, you know, everything sort of... Um, expands right uh i i do worry a great deal about uh, i have a lot of anxiety about about you know being able to to keep to keep writing and 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 create content that um you know that that my readers want to read like i i i have never wanted to be a mommy blogger or like you know someone telling you what products you should buy and like it's not i write about 12th century text right like i'm writing very esoteric pieces and i i worry about the um you know what happens to to my mind you know when i'm in the routine of baby care again and mm -hmm. taking care of older kids too um, so I, <laughs> this question is very timely. I don't have any answers. Um, but I, I do like to hold on to hope that there is that, you know, in the, given that the, the time will sort of be constricted a great deal because I'll be in this like 
this sort of uh, like routine that I can still carve out, like, you know, five minutes here, 10 minutes here. When the kid naps, you, you write a scene or, you know, like return to fiction as like, that's the core of who I am. Like I'm, I won't, I won't be reading, you know, 12th century Sufi texts, like during nap time, like that is not going to happen. I'm not writing, I'm not writing the sub stack in the same way. Um, but I think fiction, there's something about it. Like you know, it just comes from somewhere and you, and you, and, and when it comes, when the inspiration comes, you just, you go with it. And I have so many, I have been working on a, on a young adult novel for quite some time. And I've, I've also been following other authors, like inspiring people who've managed to, you know, they draft the full thing when the, you know, before the kid is two or three. And I just try to keep remembering it's possible. It's possible to keep, to keep writing, not to get deterred, you know, that the, despite the changes in life, you can you can keep continuing to hone your craft and and hold on to your brain and your sanity mm -hmm. as things change around you. Thank you, Brianna. Well, shout out to Sadia, who even aspires to write with small children. I don't think it was even on my mind. I guess when I, I got into writing kind of this round, my youngest, I guess, was two or three. But that's a stage where you are sleeping. You know, I wasn't tired. I don't think I even, yeah, I definitely was not on my mind of like trying to write. Um, maybe it was very, very briefly with my first. And then I realized, oh, he doesn't nap. I'm not going to write a novel on my maternity leave. Um, and in terms of like, I don't know, I think a little bit about how fair is it to uh, define or, or expect the way people think of themselves as writers um, based on whether or not they're a parent. And uh, for me, it is something that feels quite separate in a lot of ways. I don't write about my children and that's not really uh, something like it's not a moralistic stance. It's just, I just don't, it's not what comes to my mind when I'm writing. Um, and I think that's because part of the speed that my brain works at, I'm actually like thinking about stuff that happened even way before I had kids. That said, I think the person I am now makes me a better writer because I think I have more empathy um, just through the experience of having these three kids. I think I can more easily imagine what it's like to be other people. And I think um, that has helped me uh, take a more sympathetic approach to different types of characters in my writing. Um, so I tend to think of myself as writing in spite of my kids. I'm writing because I want to, I'm writing to show them that they should do the things that they want with their lives. And I don't think any of them want to be writers, but I just want to show them like to always make space for themselves. Um, that's it for me. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I, I very much um, identify with what both of you are describing in a lot of ways. Um, I also don't write about my kids. Um, yeah, not, I actually hadn't really thought about it before. I just, as listening to you, I'm like, oh yeah, that's just not what occurs to me to write about. I am much more into the, into the fictional world. And, and that's in some ways seems so far removed from my life with my kids at home. Um, but it's, I'm probably being affected in ways I don't really I haven't really fully processed or thought about uh, in the way you're describing. Um, I, I, I kind of had, I kind of had a little bit of a, a morbid take on this question in that I think what having children kind of taught me very early on is um, how, how it's a cliche too, but how, how, quickly time passes and that we have such a limited time here and death is coming. And I, you know, I see them grow before my eyes and it's just a constant reminder about um, how, how little time there is and how much I want to still do. And so I feel this great impulse and almost obsession, honestly, to be as productive as I can and produce what I want to produce um, before before the time is up. And the great dilemma I feel that I struggle with as a parent is I also have limited amount of time with my children. My oldest is a junior in high school right now. And so I have one more year with her at home. And so I don't want to 
be so focused on my writing that I'm not spending time with her. Um, and also just as we all know on this panel, kids are incredibly time consuming and emotionally draining. And so with limited time and limited energy, you know, how much are you gonna put aside to devote to your writing, the thing you're passionate about, the thing that gives you so much joy, if it also means trading these other things that are your priority and give you joy. And um, and again, our, there's only this limited amount of time to devote to them. So I, it, I, I feel like I just am always living in this constant state of uh, negotiation and compromise and neither one is getting the full attention I wish I could give it. So true, thank you all. Our next question is about community. So how important is community to your writing practice? And if it is important to you, where do you find it, um, either as a writer or parent or both or neither? Um, because writing in parenthood may not this mean that you have to have a community that has both. Um, and if it's not so important to you, why not? Or, you know, with whom do you commune, basically? Um, and I'll give this to Brianna first. Um, so I would say it's very important to me. Uh, I would say though that my writing community is very small. Uh, I would welcome it being larger. Uh, those are just the facts. I, for me, I've tried, you know, sort of meeting people through social media and it's just, it doesn't feel right for me. Um, I'm happier when I'm not doing much on social media. Um, I've been lucky to meet some people in person or be introduced, you know, sort of virtually through email and stuff. Um, uh, and participating in this program was a way for me that I was trying consciously to build community. I'm lucky I have a, uh, a woman that I met years ago, actually in the first writing class I took when I decided, you know, okay, I'm going to like start writing some stuff now. Um, and she and I have just remained friends and we call ourselves accountability partners and we actually get together on Zoom a couple times a week and just talk about our projects, but then also just set timers and write while the other one is there. So there's like a little bit of accountability, someone watching and making sure you're not getting up and wandering away, although she doesn't get mad when I get up and wander away. And she's someone who knows my project very well. So I can talk about characters and she'll say, well, I don't think that they would do that. Or, you know, she can really weigh in. So that's really fun. And I have another neighbor who happens to also be a writer. So that's like sort of a serendipitous connection that I know people that I see. Um, that said, I, I welcome more, more writer friends. I don't, I don't think you can have too many. Agreed. Sarah? Uh, yeah, similar. Um, I, as I said before, I prefer books to people. So I, I have found it difficult to make connections with writers, especially in ways that are sustaining, um, I've, I've gone to a couple conferences and workshops and things like that and have been able to make connections uh, and that have lasted for a fair amount of time and have been very helpful. But it's hard, you know, if you're not if you don't have a next door neighbor, it's hard to stay to sustain those connections um, virtually. And so things do tend to kind of peter out. Um, and I agree. That was one of the reasons why I um joined this program and was so grateful to Kristen for everything you did and so how generous you were. And um, it was something I was just so like um, hungering for. Uh, and I think that that kind of, this experience, that experience for me was rare and wonderful. It's, and as I said, hard to find. Um, it's a big, especially if you're doing long form writing, it's a big ask of friends, family, um, strangers on the internet to say, hey, will you read this whole thing and, and tell me what you think? Um, so yeah, it's, it's just, it's been a challenge for me to be, to be honest. Um, but, you know, I have had a, a couple people who I can, can depend on and I am very grateful for them and, and agree that it would be very nice to have, to have more people like that. Thank you, Sadia. I, I just add a little bit of a, a different perspective here. Um, since writing on Substack, which is sort of a platform for writers and readers, I have found in the year of writing that I have um, sort of 
built like these social relationships with other writers. I look forward to their writing. They read my stuff. They comment. It, it's 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 um, it's very affirming, actually. And, and I'm someone who I stay away from Instagram. I stay away from Facebook. I stay away from a lot of the social media uh, things. But this one platform, because I do like long form um, content uh, and essays, and it, it, some people write fiction on there. I I I I, I don't know that as well. But uh, but I find that there is a community of of people who are, you know, putting a lot of time, effort, and and their heart, you know, into 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 producing pieces every, you know, in a very consistent way, and uh, you build you build this relationship. Um, you build a relationship. I I feel like I'm building a relationship, and I, I, uh, and it, it's whatever you put into it too, right? Like I take the time to read it, and then comment, and um, and they take time to read and comment, and. And it, it, it grows into something else, I think. You know, you can, you can continue those conversations offline. Uh, there was one, one young woman I met. She's from Canada. And I, I you know, I, she now has my number. I have her number. Like, it started as an online thing. But now it's, like, evolved into something kind of different. And, like, she knows yeah. a little about my life. And I know a little bit about her life. And it's just, it's, it's nice. It, it is a nice thing. I have connected with other other um, writers sort of in classes, but I find it hard to sustain because I, like Sarah, prefer books to people and I'm not good about maintaining those those relationships. Uh, but on Substack, everyone is kind of showing up at the same place, like, you know, every night or whatever. And so I, it's much easier to kind of keep, keep, uh, keep those tabs open. Um, and the other thing I'd say is that because it's a community of writers and readers, like, there is more potential to find people who share your niche, you know, like you can, you can really, you can really find people who are more like-minded in terms of their, their interest areas and find people who support your work and like pay for it too, like want to be members and want to support your work financially, which is also very wild. Like I could not imagine any of my friends a year ago saying, Hey, Sadia, I want to support your writing. Like no one would say that, but because I'm on Substack, and there is a platform and there is a place where my writing lives. Um, it's actually, it's actually a very doable ask. I have so many writers who I, who I follow on Substack and just having known you has taught me so much about it. I'm not ready to go there yet, but I mean, I just love reading it and enjoying it. And I, I appreciate the resource to share with future mentees and the way you interact with it which is just so unique so thank you and my our last question for today what are some concrete tips that you have for showing up for your work even when you know circumstances might try to dictate otherwise and i'll start with sadia I find that no matter how crazy, hectic, and scattered my life feels as a primary caregiver, setting aside time for writing and creating art has become even more important for me. Um, like I like there are days when I can't get up the stairs <laughs> of my house, but I can sit on the on the bottom step and write out a scene, you know, and it feels yeah. like I'm doing something. I feel like that creativity calls to me. And so my concrete advice is to make a consistent time, you know, to reconnect with the artist inside you, like Julia Cameron talks about, right? And the artist way, like, you, you, like set that date and like, don't, don't let that go. I mean, how much control we have over a time, you know, is, is up in the air, but to the extent that we can, when the child is not, is sleeping or whatever, you know, um, uh, so that, that, that's one. And then second thing is, uh, I, I, I thought that it's important not to despair if the season of life overwhelms you, you know, um, and that, that there is hope that the, the art that you have or the story that you have to tell, you know, it will find its time and, and you will make it happen, but it might not happen in the time that you, you wish it, <laughs> it happened. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, and this is, this is probably going to sound a little, you know, 
but have faith. This is not going to sound very concrete to people, but I think having faith in yourself and the timing of things is things are meant to happen. They'll, they'll happen when they're supposed to happen. I think I truly, truly believe that. Like I, you know, I, I'm, I've always been like the goal oriented, like, okay, by 2024, I'll have this done. Or like by this age, I'll have this done. And nothing happened, you know, for years and years and years. And so it, it, it really is about learning to let go and, and, and sort of trust that, um, what's yours is going to come to you when it's supposed to. Thank you. Brianna. Uh, I think somewhat similar to Sadia, I would say, uh, you know, you're not in, in control of when your project will be finished. And I, it's so humbling. I am waking up and realizing that more and more, I keep thinking, well, you know, by June, I will feel ready to query agents or whatever. And then, you know, June comes and I realize I'm nowhere close and certain, like I'm at a, I have a pretty polished draft right now, but there are small things that I'm working on that I know need to happen. And I can't really control how long it takes me to figure out like what needs to happen in the missing scene, for example. Um, so for me, it's like letting go of that long-term timeline and just focusing on really concrete short-term deliverables. Like I have a lot of success just like promising myself, like making a little contract with myself. Okay. Every day this week, I am going to set a timer and write for 30 minutes. I could keep going or I don't have to. I also, cause in some ways I'm sort of like a small minded little person. Like I love to write down like my word count every day. And then I can look back later and be like, Oh, well, you know, it feels like I'm going at a snail's pace, but like six months ago I had you know, 40,000 fewer words. So like things like that are just like really small things that you can see versus thinking too much about the big picture. The big picture is like nice to kind of dream about, but it's like just the little, little things that I can control day to day. Uh, keep me going. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, I don't have a lot to add because I very much agree. Um, and resonate with what you're both saying, um, especially Sadia, when you were talking about um, having faith and waiting for the right time and not being able to control life. Um, and I think my concrete advice is probably most aimed at myself, <laughs> which is to forgive yourself um, for when you have these grand aspirations and plans and ideals for what you can achieve and, and produce. And then the time passes by because a kid gets sick or I've got 60 papers to grade or what all the millions of things that end up on our, on our to-do lists. And some, sometimes feel like they shouldn't take precedent over the writing, but have to um, for all kinds of important reasons. So I, I think I kind of beat myself up about not being as productive as I think I could be in the perfect circumstances, but perfect where the, the life isn't, a perfect circumstance. So yeah, being able to forgive yourself for not being able to live up to those dreams, I think is an important thing to be able to do. Thank you. Thank you all for spending some time with us, with each other, and for keeping it real. And I really appreciate knowing all of you and all of your work. Thank you so much. This is awesome. Thank you. This was a lot of fun. Thank you, Kristen, for organizing us. This was this was great. Thank you.